was the bubonic plague. <coughs> and the man who would take it on was Alexander Yersin. What had puzzled experts for centuries was the source of this mighty killer. Yersin and his fellow scientists knew that germs caused disease and people could spread them to each other. But there seemed to be no logical pattern to the plague, only random death. Until Yersin noticed something unusual. Wherever there were plague victims, there were also dead rats. And in those rats, he found the same bacteria as in the plague victims. But it wasn't the rats themselves that had infected the victims. It was later discovered that the plague bacteria was also in fleas. And it was these tiny insects that carried the bacteria from rats to people. With the mystery finally solved, public health authorities were able to stop the plague wherever it struck. And the infamous killer was virtually eliminated from the face of the earth. But fleas are not the only insects that carry disease. And the world has not been so lucky with other so-called vector-borne illnesses, especially those transmitted by mosquitoes. When you look at all of the things that convey disease, the mosquitoes at the top of the heap. They carry malaria, they carry dengue fever, they carry yellow fever, they carry things uh, from person to person because of their nasty habit of sucking up one person's blood and then sucking up another's. With insect-borne killers like West Nile virus reaching alarming heights in America, and malaria killing African children at startling rates. The question is, how do we stop the deadly messengers of disease? Coming next on Rx for Survival. Tracy McNamara had the job of her dreams. As lead pathologist at the Bronx Zoo, she could oversee the health and safety of hundreds of rare and endangered species. But little did she know she would soon become embroiled in a mystery that would bring New York City to the brink of panic. It all started with the crows. Crows were falling from the skies in large numbers. I mean, literally, these things were taking nosedives into the exhibits. These things were just dropping like stones. For over a month, New Yorkers had been noticing the dead crows all over the city. But no one paid much attention, except a concerned Tracy McNamara. We were worried immediately that whatever it was killing, these birds would spill over into our captive population of endangered species. What McNamara didn't realize was that something far worse was happening beyond the zoo. 10 miles away at Flushing Hospital in Queens, patients were being admitted with a mysterious infection that was causing their brains to swell. Dr. Debbie Asnes was at a loss to explain their symptoms. The first patient came in with fever, nausea, and vomiting, and needed to be on a respirator. Within two weeks, we had four additional patients with the same problems. Several of these patients became paralyzed, and three died. I was tearing my hair out trying to figure out what was wrong with these patients. 
Asnes feared she was seeing the outbreak of an exotic new disease. She asked for help from the city's Department of Health. Was there anything the victims had in common that could explain their mysterious illness? We asked every question we could think of. Had they shared any common exposures, any foods, any restaurants? Couldn't really find anything except all of them did seem to like to spend time outdoors, and particularly so in the evening. It wasn't much to go on, but officials wondered if another creature that comes out in the evening could be responsible. The mosquito. The city dispatched a team to canvas the area where the patients lived. This team came back saying there's lots of mosquito breeding out there and it's quite possible that this could be related to transmission of disease. But it was a remote possibility. There hadn't been a mosquito-borne epidemic in New York for over a century. This dense concrete jungle hardly seemed the place. But just to be safe, health officials had the U.S. Centers for Disease Control test samples from the flushing patients. As New York waited for an answer, several more people were stricken with the disease. Okay, here we go. And at the Bronx Zoo, a similar tragedy was unfolding among the animals. All of a sudden, we now had a flamingo that was having difficulty moving around. We had a beautiful snowy owl that had eaten breakfast. Boom, found it an hour later. This thing was just taking out everything in its path. And we felt so powerless. These were individuals we all knew and loved. Desperate to find out what was killing her birds, McNamara and her team examined brain tissue from the victims. When I looked at that first slide, it took my breath away. It was the worst encephalitis I'd seen in 18 years as a comparative pathologist. Encephalitis is an inflammation of the brain, a condition similar to the one affecting the flushing patients. But no one yet knew of this coincidence. And no one knew what was killing the people or the birds. At the CDC, the results were in. Tests indicated that the human victims were suffering from a rare illness called St. Louis encephalitis, a disease carried by mosquitoes. An outbreak of the mosquito-transmitted virus encephalitis has claimed... Suddenly, a second life New York was under siege by an insect. An 81-year-old 80, female from Flushing, Queens, but uh, she's doing well and she's out of the hospital. The mayor ordered whole sections of the city sprayed with insecticide. I think the best thing for people to do is not to panic. When Tracy McNamara heard what was causing the human deaths, she couldn't ignore the similarities. A bell went off. A scientist isn't supposed to jump to conclusions, but I felt quite strongly that there was a link between the birds and the human deaths. And that very day, I wrote my will. There was something troubling about the CDC's diagnosis. McNamara knew that birds can't get St. Louis encephalitis. So if the same disease was killing both people and birds, it had to be something else. She urged the CDC to examine her bird tissues. But in a world where public health seldom pays attention to veterinary science, she was turned away. Birds really didn't fall under the mandate of the USDA or the CDC. Um, and because of that, we sort of slipped through the cracks. McNamara sent her samples to a veterinary lab. When researchers found a type of virus never before seen in North America, an alarmed CDC joined the investigation. And they soon discovered that McNamara had been right. The virus that was infecting birds and humans was not St. Louis encephalitis, but a closely related strain from Africa known as West Nile virus. How it got to New York, no one knew. But if officials had been more alert to the potential connection between the dying birds and the human cases and begun spraying sooner, lives may have been saved. 
the fact that the disease had been announced by wild crows well in advance of human illness and we missed the diagnosis illustrates if there had been an opportunity to intervene, it was lost, and for no other reason than the alarm was sounded by a bunch of crows. The outbreak in New York stopped when cold weather brought an end to mosquito season. But not before West Nile virus had infected 61 people and taken the lives of seven. And New York was only the beginning. Infected birds carry the virus wherever they go. And if they're bitten by mosquitoes, the insidious cycle of disease will continue. A mosquito sucks up the West Nile virus along with the bird's blood. If the mosquito then bites another bird, or a different animal, or a person, the virus can be passed on and on. The mosquito is the go-between, the delivery agent, the vector of disease. On the wings of infected birds and mosquitoes, West Nile virus spread relentlessly across the United States. In just four years, it killed countless animals and infected 14,000 people. Over 500 died. Nothing could stop it. When the virus reached Colorado, it had what I would call the perfect storm. The virus newly entering the state, in combination with the right weather conditions, caused a huge outbreak. Lyle Peterson is the nation's top official monitoring the West Nile outbreak. When the virus invaded Colorado, Peterson got to meet his nemesis firsthand. I went out to go get my mail started chatting with my neighbor and we both noticed we were getting bitten by mosquitoes. Well, by that time, both of us, as it turned out, got infected with West Nile virus. Muscle aches, eye pain, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. It was three miserable weeks of my life where I missed a significant amount of work. Peterson was lucky. He had a mild case known as West Nile fever. Paging Dr. Moffitt. But some victims can develop a far more serious form of the disease. West Nile paralysis. Bob was a very active man. We like to hike in the mountains, and he loved to watch the eagles and hawks. The illness came on really quickly. We were in the mountains on uh, Monday, the 1st of August, and by Thursday, he was on life support. Bob French and his wife, Joyce, had just returned from a 40th anniversary trip to Hawaii. A healthy father of four, Bob was coming home from work one evening when he got what he thought was a normal mosquito bite. He was wrong. Take some deep breaths for me, if you would. For Bob, that part of your brain that controls motor function essentially shut down. Good. That's like having a giant stroke, and uh, that is not coming back. It's going to be you know, a couple more weeks on the antibiotics, but... Uh, There's there absolutely several. nothing we can do about it. I certainly didn't think that a mosquito could cause such a life-altering experience. Who would think a little mosquito could do all that? Mosquitoes, ticks, and other blood-sucking creatures have been doing a masterful job of spreading disease since humans first walked the planet. And for most of that time, we were utterly powerless to stop them because we didn't even know they were doing it. At the turn of the last century, a horrible outbreak of a disease called yellow fever brought Cuba to its knees. Compounding the fear was that nobody knew what caused yellow fever or how to stop it. 
When yellow fever struck, mass panic would ensue because up to 25 or 30 percent of a town's population would actually die during some of these epidemics. Most believed that yellow fever was spread by close human contact or soiled bed linens. But one man had a very different idea, a young American physician named Jesse Lazier. As he studies this mysterious illness, Lazier becomes convinced that the theory of a maverick Cuban-American doctor is right. In 1881, Carlos Finley, a physician in Havana, postulated that the household mosquito was the vector of yellow fever. Finley tried in approximately 104 experiments to transmit yellow fever from an infected person to a volunteer using a mosquito, but his attempts failed. Lazier thinks he knows why. He believes that the yellow fever germ has to incubate inside the mosquito before it becomes infectious, and that Carlos Finley failed because he tried to infect his volunteers too soon. So Lazier realized that they should do the mosquito experiments again, allowing a mosquito to feed on an early case of the disease and then allowing the mosquito to incubate for at least 10 days before trying to infect a volunteer. What Lazier needs is a new volunteer, but he is loath to ask anyone to take such a risk. Several days after allowing himself to be bitten, Jesse Lazier lay near death. He had sacrificed his own life to save untold others. It was now clear that yellow fever was transmitted by mosquitoes. The U.S. Army launched an all-out war on the deadly pests, draining swamps, spraying insecticide, in only seven months, Cuba was completely rid of the disease. Yellow fever had been new to Cuba. It was probably brought by an infected passenger or a mosquito that came to the island by ship from South America where the disease was rampant. Diseases had been spread this way for centuries, but now in the age of jet travel, it's far easier for mosquito-borne diseases to hitch a ride to virtually anywhere. In fact, this may be exactly how West Nile virus found its new home. Once an obscure disease from Uganda, West Nile has now become a serious threat to most of the United States. And for some people, the results have been devastating. A year and a half after his mosquito bite, Bob French is still on life support. Okay, it's Bob, you okay? Yeah. But he's regained some motor control. There's some people a lot worse off than I am. They can't move anything or do anything. I can raise my hand a little and work my fingers a little bit. I can turn my head. I'm just a, a drain right now. No, you are not. <laughs> No, you're not, Papa. Don't you say that. Our finances are going down the tube. Colorado's first West Nile summer produced almost 3,000 cases and 63 deaths. Now the disease was headed for California, and officials in the nation's most populous state began preparing for the worst. The first thought that came to our mind 
was that there are 36 million people in the state. We could have had a major disaster. Minu Madden is head of surveillance for the LA County Vector Control District. Charged with tracking the virus in one of the most densely populated counties in the nation, his job will not be easy. This is the greatest challenge I've faced in my 39-year career in public health. Madden directs a team that will monitor the county's birds and mosquitoes. If there's any hope of defending Californians from West Nile, they must pinpoint exactly where and when the virus strikes. One of their essential tools, the sentinel chicken. Jennifer Wilson is on the surveillance team's Hollywood beat. We have seven sentinel chicken flocks and they're distributed throughout the county. We use them as an early warning sign against disease. The chickens can catch the virus from a mosquito bite but they're not sickened by the disease. So Jennifer and others constantly check the chicken's blood to see if the mosquito-borne virus has arrived. While Jennifer keeps tabs on the birds, another division takes to the streets. Kevin Vargas leads the county's vector control squad. Their job, reduce mosquito populations and breeding grounds before the virus gets here. People ask you, well, how do you combat mosquitoes? And I said, well, you have to almost think like a mosquito. You really do have to think about where water sources are, soda pop cans, bicycle handlebars, anywhere where water collects and they can find an opening to get in and lay their eggs, that's where they'll be. We've got mosquito larvae and there'll be adult mosquitoes looking for their next victim. I think we're gonna have to nuke them. It's July, the height of mosquito season. And the first sentinel chicken has tested positive. As in New York, the first victims are the crows. But this time, the warning is not ignored. Good morning, West Nile Virus Hotline. Maya speaking. How may I help you? Hi, uh, I think I have a dead crow here. It looks pretty fresh. Like you report a dead bird. I think it's a crow. Big and black. 20 inches? Yeah, it's about that. Okay, it sounds like a crow. And where are you calling from? The crows are really the only visible sign that there's something going on. The sick one was picked up right in front, right here on, on this grass area. So far this year, we're up to 450, and we're only halfway through the summer. And then the inevitable happened. A 57-year-old Orange County man has died of the West Nile virus and is the first fatality from the disease reported in California. Meantime, state health officials say the mosquito-borne disease... What we are seeing now is just the tip of the iceberg. I cannot predict how many human cases we may end up with, but I believe there'll be a significant number occurring here in California. The residents of Los Angeles can only hope that their vector control team can stop West Nile from spreading before the death toll mounts. But across the world, there are few vector control teams and untold millions are under constant attack from the most deadly mosquito-borne killer of all, malaria. No place on Earth suffers more from malaria than Sub-Saharan Africa. While people of all ages get the disease, it is most devastating to children. Over one million children die of malaria every year. Dr. Juliana Otiano is on the front lines of malaria's devastation. Head of pediatrics at the Nyanza District Hospital in Kisumu, Kenya, Otieno has walked these wards for two decades. The hospital has 80 beds, with at least two children to a bed. 90% have malaria. 
Dr. Otieno knows these symptoms all too well. She loses three to five children every day. So it's quite distressing. If other days you don't want to come to the ward because a child will die in your hands. Malaria is not caused by a virus like West Nile or yellow fever. It's caused by a microscopic animal, a parasite. The parasite enters the bloodstream with the bite of a mosquito and soon transforms itself so it can invade red blood cells. This parasite that's living in the red blood cells is multiplying and bursting the red blood cells. And the child becomes very, very anemic. And that anemia can then lead to death. And the death can be very rapid. It can be within hours. Dr. Mary Hamill has been fighting the uphill battle against malaria in Africa for years. Malaria is everywhere here. If you went out in the village and took blood samples, you'd find that 80 to 90 percent of children have malaria right now. For Judith Otiambo, malaria is a constant worry. She's looking after five children. Two of them, her 18-month-old son, Ben, and her grandchild, Kevin, are sick. Ben has a bad cough, diarrhea, fever, vomiting, and stomach pains. They're very sick. I'm frightened they will both die. Judith has already lost two children to malaria. She remembers the day she took them to the local clinic a two-hour walk away. The first one died on the way to the hospital. The second one died within two hours of getting there. It was a terrible loss, like losing a part of myself. While malaria can be deadly for children, Adults gain partial immunity through multiple infections. But still, they will have long bouts of sickness and fatigue. If a father has malaria, he can't go out and work to bring home funds and food for the family. This is a disease of poverty, and it keeps people impoverished. Judith heads for a local pharmacy to get anti-malarial drugs. There are many medicines for sale, but here in Kenya, few of these remedies are worth buying. There have been reports that as much as 30% of the drugs found in shops in Kenya are counterfeit. This is really a tragedy because mothers think they're doing the right thing, but the drug that they're getting may not help their child at all. Judith buys a well-known brand of the malaria drug, commonly called SP, for about 30 cents. But even if it's not counterfeit, it may not work. SP is the latest in a series of anti-malarial drugs that have been rendered nearly useless by the malaria parasite, which keeps evolving resistance to every one of these medicines. It used to be that you could treat a case of malaria for pennies. But the drugs that are available, that are affordable, just don't work anymore. With no good treatment available, the survival of Ben and Kevin has become a frightening game of chance. A game that a million African children lose every year. But why are the children of Africa still dying of malaria? When history has shown that this disease can be controlled, Less than a century ago, malaria was rampant in America. Thousands suffered its fevers and chills every year. But by the 1940s, malaria had been virtually eliminated from the United States by draining swamps, screening windows, and spraying insecticides. 
This remarkable achievement was inspired in large part by the efforts of an American doctor named Fred Soper. Soper became a legend in Brazil, where he'd led a campaign against yellow fever in the 1930s. It was so successful, the Brazilian government asked him to take on the more difficult problem of malaria. Soper strode across the field of international health for decades. He was someone who achieved a great deal by being tremendously organized, tremendously disciplined, uh, and applying that discipline to all those who worked with him. Soper was not focused on treating malaria victims. His target was the particular mosquito that spread the disease most rapidly. Anopheles Gambi. Soper declares war on the Anopheles with only one goal total eradication. There's no such thing as partial success in species eradication. One either achieves glorious success or dismal failure. Soper mounts a military style campaign, dividing the country into sectors and attacking them one after the other, fumigating homes, draining swamps, and poisoning every mosquito breeding site they can find. So the coverage was 100%. Some people have referred to Soper as the general patent of malaria control. Soper's campaign is relentless and uncompromising, and it works. By 1940, he had eliminated the Anopheles Gambi from Brazil and reduced malaria deaths considerably. He was so successful, many believed malaria could be controlled in other countries as well. With Fred Soper leading the way, 55 nations signed up for the Global Malaria Eradication Program in 1948. Their goal, to wipe malaria from the face of the earth by using the most powerful weapon to date, a chemical spray called DDT. DDT revolutionized vector control. Because it was so cheap, you could apply vector control to whole countries. The initial results were dramatic. Malaria was either sharply curtailed or eliminated from nearly 40 countries. But just as Soper and his colleagues were on the cusp of victory, the campaign stalls. The enemy proved to be more resilient than anyone had imagined. Mosquitoes are tough buggers. Nobody had recognized just how quickly mosquitoes would develop resistance to DDT. And secondly, uh, no one had anticipated that DDT would have some very significant environmental impacts that people would start to agitate against. Commercial farmers had been quick to jump on the DDT bandwagon because it easily killed crop-destroying insects. But it killed other creatures as well and was harmful to the environment. In 1972, DDT was widely banned and the Global Malaria Eradication Program collapsed. Sadly, they never even reached Africa, where the disease was spreading fast. Today, more people die of malaria than ever before. Malaria is off the radar screen. It doesn't get the support, doesn't get the funding, doesn't get the attention that it deserves. Even if it is one of the key factors holding back Africa's development today. Without large-scale spraying, the burden of fighting malaria has fallen completely on medicines, many of which are no longer effective. Some experts believe we should bring back DDT, but with a safer spraying strategy. There was never a problem from spraying DDT in people's homes against mosquitoes that transmit malaria. 
The environmental problems came from farmers using DDT in much larger amounts to protect their crops. We need to use DDT now to help as another important tool, in a relatively inexpensive tool, to protect a lot more people from dying of malaria. One day after taking SP, Judith Otiambo's son, Ben, is feeling a little better. But her grandson, Kevin, seems to be getting worse. With the help of her daughter, she sets off on the two-hour walk to the clinic. Both children are tested for malaria. Ben tests negative. Kevin is positive. The SP is not working. All Kevin's doctor can do is prescribe quinine, the oldest malaria treatment, to be given in combination with SP. <coughs> Taking a combination of drugs even those that individually have lost their power, has often produced good results. Judith buys the quinine and more SP. They're the only medications she can afford. She doesn't have money to come back in case any complication develops. If she doesn't get the treatment properly, the child will probably die. With newer medications too expensive for poor people and vaccines still in development, malaria remains one of the most intractable and deadly diseases in the world. But the situation is not completely hopeless, thanks to the behavior of nocturnal mosquitoes. They like to live in the thatch of people's huts, where they wait until nightfall. They come out to feed on sleeping people, a trait that has led to a simple way to combat malaria. Bed nets treated with insecticide. CDC did a study in an area with very, very intense malaria transmission. 130,000 people were provided bed nets. And sure enough, we saw that you could reduce transmission of the deadliest malaria by 90% just by keeping them under bed nets. One week after his trip to the clinic, things are looking up for Kevin. When we got home from the clinic, I gave him the medicine and he started to get better. Kevin may not have gotten the best drug therapy, but he survived malaria this time around. And the chances of Kevin and Ben staying malaria-free have just increased tremendously. The film crew donated a $5 bed net, something Judith could not have afforded on her own. But millions of other children won't be so fortunate. There's no reason that the world has to sit by and watch a million African children die from malaria each year. No reason at all. Most of those kids could be saved through a combination of sleeping under bed nets, of early case detection and treatment with first-line anti-malarials. All of it requires financial resources beyond the means of malaria-impacted regions, but utterly, utterly, and I'll say it a third time, utterly within the means of the rich world. We'd hardly notice. Far across the African continent, in the mountains of Togo, another insect-borne disease known as river blindness has long haunted the people of the Kara River Basin. But unlike malaria, river blindness is now coming under control, thanks to a combination of Western medicine and local activism.
As far back as anyone can remember, blindness has lived here. The people have a saying, the river eats your eyes. But the river itself is not the culprit. The disease is transmitted by an insect, not a mosquito in this case, but a tiny black fly. The flies breed in the river, where they ingest the larvae of a parasitic worm. The larvae start to grow inside the fly and are passed to humans when the fly bites. Once inside the bloodstream, they fully mature and begin multiplying. Over a 15-year lifespan, the adult worms produce millions of offspring that travel through the body, causing unbearable itching. They also enter the eye, producing scarring and eventually blindness. These people are itching, scratching all the time and it's a miserable way to live. People commit suicide because it's the first thing they know in the morning, the last thing they know at night. Many victims of river blindness lose their sight in their mid-30s. But for Jillian, the world went dark when she was still a teenager. When I give birth to my children, it hurt me that I could not see their faces. There have been many times when I try opening my eyelids as wide as possible, hoping I will see again, but I don't. For Jillian, daily survival is fraught with danger. To gather wood for cooking, she must wander across unknown terrain, unable to see snakes or other hazards. My prayer is that my kids will grow up healthy and take care of me. If they become blind, what hope does any of us have? Sadly, most children here believe that one day they too will end up on the other end of the stick, blindly following the next generation. You could fly over such areas and identify them because the thatch roofs are not being repaired, the farms are not being farmed, and people are either being led around or lying around as a result of the impact of river blindness. In the 1970s, the disease had affected 35 countries. 18 million people were infected with the parasite. One million were already blind. The situation was desperate until, quite unexpectedly, a ray of hope emerged from the United States. In the 1980s, the dogs of America were suddenly freed from debilitating parasitic worms, thanks to a new drug called ivermectin. The dewormer worked so well for dogs and other animals that scientists began to wonder if it could be adapted to kill the worms that cause river blindness. In the late 1980s, a human form of the drug, called mectazan, was tested in a hard-hit region. And it worked brilliantly. But in sub-Saharan Africa, most river blindness victims are desperately poor. They could not afford even one dose of the drug. And mectazan needs to be taken regularly, once every year, to keep the disease under control. We had a drug which we deeply believed could have an enormous impact on human health in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. But we could not charge a dollar a person per year 25 cents a year, 10 cents a year. These people cannot afford it at any price. We really did not know what we were going to do. Then in 1987, Merck made a stunning announcement. If people couldn't afford Mectazan, the company would give it away for as long as it was needed. 
This commitment held out the promise of a vastly better life for millions of people worldwide. But there was still a seemingly insurmountable problem. Most river blindness sufferers lived many miles from passable roads. So aid workers could not get the drug to every village and farm once a year, every year. What was needed was a localized distribution system, an idea championed by a stately, charismatic woman from Nigeria, Uche Amazigo. The people that have river blindness are the poorest of the poor. They are far from the cities, beyond the end of the road. We have over 100,000 communities scattered in 24 countries today. How are we going to manage? Uche's plan was for individual communities to distribute mechtizan themselves without outside help. Drawing on both her doctorate in public health and a deep knowledge of the people of the bush, Uche knew that her first task was to win over the village chiefs. When we want to approach a community, the first person we visit in any village is the chief of that village and tell them that here is a pill that will stop your children from ever going blind. Until recently, villagers performed ritual dances to chase away the evil spirits of river blindness. Now, with the chief's backing, Uche convinces them to put their trust in a tiny white pill. The next challenge is to train people in the proper use of mechtizan and recruit volunteers to deliver the medicine by foot or by bicycle to the most isolated farms. But it's asking a lot of people who live in such poverty to donate their time with no compensation. One of the villages we went to refused to distribute this peel because they wanted boots and they wanted raincoats. And we know that if we start giving the, out this sort of incentive, the program cannot pay for it. <laughs> Uche reminds the villagers that Mechtizan is being donated cost-free for as long as it's needed. Giving a bit of their time is all that's required to assure a life free from river blindness for themselves and their children. Uche prevails. Dozens volunteer to deliver Mechtizan once a year, every year, until the cycle of disease is broken. Unlike malaria, river blindness has now been dramatically reduced. River blindness is certainly a success story in Africa. The idea that uh, communities should be involved in their own health, arranging to take and have their neighbors take this tablet, that has been a kind of revolution in international uh, public health. But if the program falters, and the medicine is not delivered every year, river blindness, like malaria, will return in force. If we still leave people harboring these worms, the flies will pick up the worms from those that are infected, cross to other countries, even where we have already achieved success, and infest those people and begin the whole problem again. They cannot stop now because the disease will come back. The best way to stop a vector disease from spreading is to keep it from taking hold in the first place. In the summer of 2004, in California, that's exactly what Kevin Vargas and his mosquito warriors are trying to do in their battle against West Nile virus. But even here, in one of the wealthiest parts of the world, insect-borne diseases are extremely difficult, if not impossible, to control. 
There's between 15 and 20,000 miles of underground storm drains in the Los Angeles area. They're perfect for mosquitoes to breed in. They'll hang out down in there during the daytime and then at night they'll fly out and get their blood meals before they lay their eggs. As more human deaths are reported, the team resorts to limited spraying of insecticide, a tactic they'd hope to avoid in this environmentally conscious state. By December, West Nile virus had infected over 800 Californians. 28 had died. But just when things were looking bad, the number of new cases began to drop. The efforts of the mosquito warriors, combined with the arrival of cooler weather, ended the state's first outbreak. I feel we were successful to a certain degree, even though there was some fatalities that was expected. But we'll still be out there. Mosquitoes never take a vacation, especially here in California. And if you drop your guard, they're going to be ready and waiting to get you. People that think that the virus has come through and has disappeared are in for a big surprise. There's no way to get rid of every single infected mosquito. It's here to stay. Even if vector-borne diseases can't be eliminated entirely, with the right resources, they can be controlled, as California has shown. And this is crucial, because West Nile will hardly be the last of these threats. In a world where no disease is more than a plane ride away, and no environment is immune. People think that mosquitoes are associated with swamps and jungles. Unfortunately, man has unknowingly created many, many different types of sources to produce a lot more mosquitoes than you perhaps might find in the natural situations. Vectors have adapted to everything the human population has thrown at them. They outnumber us, they outweigh us, and they've been at the survival game a lot longer than the human population. This is going to be a long time struggle. Next time on Rx for Survival, sometimes the most difficult problems have the simplest solutions. I had never seen this kind of a dramatic impact. And workers are struggling to contain epidemics in Asia and Africa. It scares me, frankly, to think about what will happen if we don't get this to work. I think we'll lose half the continent of Africa. Don't miss the two-part conclusion of Rx for Survival. Learn more about global health, then find out how you can make a difference at pbs.org. To order Rx for Survival on DVD or VHS or the companion book to the series, please call 1-800-255-9424.